calling us, Lord, to come into your presence. Lord, to encounter you in this time and in this space. And we live in such a noisy world. Lord, there's so much clutter outside. There's so much clutter within. And so we take a moment now to be still and to just know that you are God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak today and that you would open not just our ears but our minds and our hearts and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together would be pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. When the tears came, they came so suddenly Uh, that they completely caught me by surprise. It was after a leadership team meeting in the church that I had served previously, and one of the elders, who was also a dear friend of mine, his name is Pat, hung around afterwards, and he asked me this question. He said, Brian, how are you doing? How are you really doing? And I I think it was that question in that moment, this is what caught me by surprise, is that that question just kind of had a way of uncorking for me all of these pent-up emotions that I thought I had stuffed down inside and locked in a vault. And, And suddenly those emotions just came out with force like a tidal wave. And in a rare moment of vulnerability, I shared with my friend, I said, you know, I said, things are going well in the church, but Pat, I gotta be honest with you, I'm dying inside. I said, my marriage is struggling, Tammy and I just feel like we're not connecting, you know, we're we're in the trenches of trying to raise two small children. Um, I feel like I'm working all the time, and that I'm trying to please everybody, and I can't do it, and I said, inside, I just, I feel, if I'm honest, I feel angry, and I feel resentful. Here I'm trying to help everybody else experience God's presence, and yet I'm not experiencing God's presence in my personal life. God seems so far away. And then I shared with them that I had actually kind of thought about maybe it was even time for me to resign, and maybe I needed to look for a different church. And in my worst moments, I think I I was at a place where I was so discouraged that I wondered if I just needed to walk away from ministry and do something else altogether. My friend um, listened empathetically and, and he spoke some kind words. I can't remember exactly what he said, but there was tenderness in his words. And then he prayed with me. And, and in that moment, it felt good to be able to finally kind of take off the mask and to be honest about how I was really doing. But I have to tell you, the next day I got up and I had what Brene Brown calls a vulnerability hangover. Uh, I don't know if that's ever happened to you too, but I thought, oh my goodness, did I share too much? Um, you know, what's, what's my friend gonna think of me? Is he, is he gonna think that, that I'm a competent leader? Is he gonna think that I'm a strong leader? Or is he gonna think that I'm emotional and weak and that I don't have it all together? I wish that I could tell you that, that in that kind of cathartic moment with my friend when I really took the mask off, I wish I could tell you that that was a, 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 a key moment of change for me and that things were different from that point on. But, but the, it, it wasn't. What I did is I kind of put the mask back on I stuffed the emotions back down. I got busy doing work for God and keeping myself preoccupied. And all the while, for the next couple years, in fact, I I just personally, it it had an enormous cost in terms of my health and my most important relationships. It wasn't until two years later, in March of 2011, that I had a, a, a spiritual breakthrough. And I was at a retreat, a faith walking retreat was the name of it, down in Houston, Texas with about uh, 30 other pastors. And, and it was an, it, at this retreat where I think one of the things that happened is that I had a couple days where I finally got to slow down and really get present to God and to myself, to get honest with God and myself and with others, to take off the mask and, and not put it back on, but to kind of risk being vulnerable And what was so significant about that experience for me 
is that I think for the first time, I really was able to kind of do some of this inward work of looking at what was going on inside of me. And I became painfully aware that I was doing the work of God in the world at a pace that was destroying the work of God in me. I was doing the work of God in the world at a pace that was destroying the work of God in my marriage, in some of my other key relationships, even impacting my relationship with God. And I remember writing in my journal at that time, I cannot keep doing this, something needs to change. But here's the thing, is that I think that, that for so long, I thought that what needed to change was out here, right? If, if, if I could just somehow change the expectations in the congregation, um, if I could somehow, um, if, if I could change Tammy, you know, because she needed all the, the fixing, right? Then, then the marriage would be better. If I could somehow kind of get the staff to do what I wanted them to do, then, then things would be better. It was, it, was, it was all of this stuff out here that needed to change, and what the Holy Spirit showed to me is that while, while there are certainly external things that impact us, I mean, that's the way that living systems work, right? But, but the, the deep change that needed to happen wasn't out here, it was in here. It was in me. I was the greatest obstacle to my own flourishing. Nobody else was. Nothing else was. You know, I, I believe that. I believe that when we find ourselves stuck, when we find ourselves frustrated, when we find ourselves um, just kind of hitting the wall, that really, when it comes down to it, we are the greatest obstacles to our flourishing. That, that we get in our own way. And as I was able to be honest about that and allow God to begin this work of deep transformation within me, I mean, it's, it's had deep impact on my life, my ministry, all of my relationships. I'm still growing, I'm still learning, and it's so easy to fall back into these patterns. But today, we're beginning a eight-week sermon series that we're calling Beneath the Surface. And, and this is an opportunity. I'm, I'm so excited about this because I've seen how this kind of work has made a difference in my life. And I'm excited about inviting you into this journey because I think that if you are open to it and if you're willing to engage, that God could use this series to do some deep transformation in your own life and to bring health and healing to all of your relationships. It's kind of like this iceberg, right? I mean, you've seen this picture or a version of this picture before, and imagine your life as this iceberg, and 10%, and right, of the iceberg is visible, but 90% of it is beneath the surface, it's hidden. And I think that this is true when it comes to our lives, and so often the way that we do discipleship um, is that it's that 10% that's visible, and, and this is the part that we often like to control. It's the, it's the part um, that has to kind of do with our image or we way, the way that we want others to see us. I think this is the way we tend to show up in public and so often in church. In fact, I, I think that church is one of the places where we're best at putting on the masks and at hiding and doing everything we can to make it look like we've got our lives and our families all put together but it's the 90% beneath the surface, and what I wanna to suggest to you today is that the place that we're getting stuck, and the place where God wants to bring his greatest healing and transformation is, is, is in that 90% beneath. I mean, even, even if we've begun to dip beneath the surface, and maybe we're trying to address issues in our life, doing things like Bible studies and, and, and practices like prayer and small groups and using your gifts to serve, those are all wonderful things and important things. But God, God wants to do a deep work of transformation in our lives. And the place where we are stuck is that deep place where we don't know what we don't know. That's why we're stuck. And the only way that we're able to kind of gain clarity on what needs to he be healed and transformed from within is if we allow the Holy Spirit to shine his light in those places, which requires honesty and openness and the willingness to get beneath the surface. The way that we're gonna engage the series together is, is we're actually gonna be using a book by Peter Scazzaro called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I know a number of you have already picked up this book. Uh, each Sunday, 
uh, we're going to engage some of the core content in each of these chapters. Scazzaro puts out, um, lays out for us really seven kind of critical pathways by which to experience what he calls emotionally healthy spirituality. And so each Sunday, we're going we're gonna to engage those together. Um, but I want to talk just a little bit as a way of kind of setting this up for us. I mean, this, this, this phrase, emotionally healthy spirituality, what does that mean? Um, and, and, and what Scazzaro wants to do is he wants to combine these two things, emotional health and, um, and spiritual maturity. What, what is emotional health? When we talk about emotional health, emotional health really at its heart is about growing in our, our self-awareness. It's about becoming attentive to what's going on inside of us, about our own emotions, about um, the way that we function when we feel anxious. Uh, it's, it's about uh, the way that we handle conflict or don't or avoid it. Um, it's our default pattern so often with the way we show up in relationship with others. In spiritual maturity, so if emotional health is about growing in self-awareness, emotional maturity, or excuse me, spiritual maturity is about growing in our God awareness. Um, it's about deepening in our relationship with God and a, a deeper kind of trust and obedience that gets beyond just, you know, kind of external religious activities, but it's at the, this, this deep place of transformation in the heart. Here's what Scazzaro writes, and I want to just put this statement in the space this morning and let it sit with you for a moment. Scazzaro says that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. I want to let those words just hang in the space right now. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally mature. You see, God has made us to be whole persons in his image. And that means that there's a lot of different components to who we are. So maybe you've seen something like this pie chart, this wellness chart, and I want you to think about it in terms of discipleship. Because when we think about discipleship, there's these different components. You've got the intellectual, the physical, the spiritual, the vocational, the social, the emotional. And I think that the way that we've tended to do discipleship in the church, at least in the West, is that where we focus, so often we focus on the intellectual on getting the right information, which is important. All of these parts are important. Maybe we focus on the social. A lot of us see church as a place for us to have social connections. That's important. Or maybe we focus on the spiritual, you know, different practices like prayer and using our gifts to serve. I think uh, one of the places, though, that we, we tend to neglect the most and it's most underdeveloped is, is, is this aspect of the emotional. And yet this is so important if we're gonna really live into God's design because God created us as emotional beings. Now some of you already are thinking, what? Is this gonna be like one of those touchy-feely sermon series where Pastor Brian's gonna make us get into a circle and share our feelings? And you're like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't talk about feelings. I don't, I don't do emotions. Uh, and, I, and I would say, yes, you do. It's, it's inescapable. It's, it's the way that you've been created it's, it's, it's really kind of what do we tend to do with our emotions and it's a lot of it is for men but I don't think it's just men I don't want to just kind of play to gender stereotypes but I think for a lot of us we're, we don't trust our emotions uh, emotions to, to engage our emotions feels weak we feel vulnerable and I'm just going to ask you that throughout this series when you begin to feel uncomfortable you're going to have to make a choice are you going to disengage or are you going to stay engaged with me and I'm going to ask you to move towards the discomfort and to stay with me and to trust me in this because if you're willing to do that, I believe that God is gonna reveal to you some really significant things. I like the way that this man put it when he was reflecting on his own life, Jay. Jay says, you know, I was a Christian for 22 years, but instead of being a 22-year-old Christian, I was a one-year-old Christian 22 times. I just kept doing the same things over and over and over again. And I think for a lot of us, that's true. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad, to feel shame. I'm just saying, I think this is true for a lot of us. Maybe we've been part of church all our life, but we're still emotional and spiritual infants or adolescents. And God wants us to grow up into the fullness of Christ. This sermon series is an invitation for you to do that, for us to do it together. I wanna begin this morning then by 
getting into the scriptures, and I wanna look at an example of somebody who actually, tragically, is a case study of what happens when you are unwilling to go beneath the surface and to grow in emotional health and spiritual maturity. Uh, this man's name is Saul, and he's found in the Old Testament. You can, you can, you can um, read his story in 1 Samuel. Now Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul was made king uh, because the nation of Israel insisted upon having an earthly king like all of the other nations around them. Now this was a bad idea from the start. Uh, the prophet Samuel, who kind of is a major character in First and Second Samuel, the prophet Samuel comes to them and they want an earthly king and Samuel says, no you don't. This, this is, I mean look at how that's working out for the rest of the nations around you. God is your king. You know, trust God, fear God. But they were persistent. They said, no, no, we, we want an earthly king like everybody else. And God, in just the mystery of the way that he kind of enters in and works with the mess of who we are, God grants them this request. God says to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So God gives them an earthly king. He anoints Saul to be the first king. And Saul, like Saul, you need to know, he had the perfect image of a strong and competent leader who could rally people together, who could lead a nation. In fact, here's what the writer of 1 Samuel tells us about Saul. I mean, on, in terms of appearances, listen to this. There was not a man among the people of Israel who was more handsome than he. He stood head and shoulders taller than everybody else. In the ancient world, and there's still, this is still kind of true in our culture, that physical height and, and kind of um, physical, um, you know, uh, physical presence was a sign of strength and a sign, of, um, a sign of, of competence. Paul was taller than anybody else. The Spirit of God came upon Saul, and, and he was an impressive leader at first. I mean, Saul was a gifted guy. He was an incredible military strategist. I mean, Saul's the kind of guy, like he could make things happen. He can get things done. And so that's what we see happening is that Saul, as the Spirit's upon him and in the Spirit's power, begins to lead the Israelite army against um, these other nations in battle and, and they're victorious against all odds. But then things begin to go south for Saul. Saul. Things begin to go south for Saul because he may have been outwardly impressive, but Saul's problem is that he was not willing to go beneath the surface, that he neglected the inner world, this inner place of his own heart. And this would be really the beginning of his unraveling. I want to share with you from 1 Samuel chapter 13 this morning. Um, there's a lot of places that we could enter into this story and get a glimpse of Saul's life. But I wanna go here, and this is different than what's in your, your bulletin, and I just feel like this, this, this is the place where I wanna take us today. So let's walk into this story together, and along the way, I wanna just stop, and I wanna point out a few things as we think about emotional health and spiritual maturity. So the Philistines assembled to fight Israel. 1 Samuel 13, beginning at verse five. The Philistines, who were Israel's great enemy, they had 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand of the seashore. They went up and they camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon, and when the Israelites saw their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns, and some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. So here you have the Israelites backed up in a corner against the Philistines, the Philistines breathing down their neck. And one of the striking things about this part of the story is that if you were to read a number of the battles that happened previously, explicitly within that story, it talks about how the Spirit of God was with Saul and was with the Israelite army, and they depended upon his strength, and they were energized, and they were uh, courageous, and they fought valiantly. But here we have the Israelites now, instead of being courageous, they find themselves crippled by fear. They go off and they hide. Many of them run away. And it's not just the Israelites who are crippled by their fear and anxiety. Saul himself 
is crippled by fear and anxiety, but he's not aware of it because he hasn't done this work of looking inside. Here's what the story goes on to say. So Saul remained at Gilgal, and all of the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel the prophet, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering just as he finished, and just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. So Saul is waiting for seven days for Samuel to come, as Samuel promised. Seven sleepless nights and ulcer-inducing days. I mean, so much pressure that he was under. Still no Samuel. Notice what Saul doesn't do during this time. Did you notice that he doesn't seek God? That he doesn't pray? He doesn't call out to God? In fact, curiously, there is no mention at all of the Spirit of God in this part of the story, which is a striking contrast to what we've seen up to this point. Did the Spirit leave Saul, or was Saul just closing himself off to the Spirit's presence? So what does Saul do? In his anxiety and in his fear, Saul does what I think most of us tend to do when we're anxious and afraid. He tries to take control of the situation. He takes matter in, matters into his own hands. Instead of trusting God, he gives the orders to bring the burnt offering and to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Now maybe you'll say, but what's wrong with that? I mean, isn't that good? I mean, he's worshiping God. Isn't that what he's supposed to be doing? No, there's everything wrong with this because God had commanded Saul that he wasn't to be the one who was to offer the burnt offering Samuel the prophet or the priest, they alone were the ones who were able to offer this kind of sacrifice. God told Saul that he couldn't do this. And yet Saul disobeys God's commands. Here's what Saul says when Samuel says to him, what have you done? Listen, listen to his excuse. Listen to what he says. He says, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. So I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. Read the subtext, I felt anxious. I felt afraid. And so I took it into my own hands. And what Saul does in this time of disobedience, and this is what the writer wants us to see, is that, that Saul, rather than fearing the Lord, which was about reverence to God, rather than obeying God, rather than trusting God, Saul is more afraid of the Philistines who are pressing down upon him, and he is more afraid of losing control and power as the king. And it's that fear that trumps his obedience to the Lord. Samuel goes on to say, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command that the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Listen to the consequences of Saul's disobedience. But now, your kingdom will not endure. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and has appointed him to be ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. This isn't gonna be the last time that Saul is disobedient. In fact, if you would read on, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but this story just continues to become more tragic. In chapter 15, when he goes into battle again, Saul, this will kind of be the camel that breaks the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back because um, Saul again will be disobedient to God and, and Samuel confirms God's decision that Saul will no longer be king. Instead, that God has another who would succeed Saul but this is a man who would chase after God's own heart. This is a, a foreshadowing of David. And we're gonna talk about David next week. There's such a contrast between the two of them, by the way, Saul and David. But here's, here's one of the most important things that I wanna say this morning about Saul. As I kinda hold up Saul, and, and I'm not trying to be too hard on Saul, because I think Saul, at least for me and maybe for you, he, he, he presents a kind of mirror for us to possibly see ourselves. 
But the most important thing that I want to say this morning about Saul's primary downfall, it was not that he was a flawed and and broken person. I mean, it wasn't that he had fears and insecurities, that he felt anxiety and he felt overwhelmed from life's pressures. I mean, we all feel that, right? I mean, that's what it means to be human. But here was Saul's primary downfall. He was unwilling to go beneath the surface. He lacked self-awareness. And how his own fragile ego, his own fear and insecurity, how it was impacting others around him. Most of all, Saul lacked any kind of inner life with God. It was all about the surface for him. And and the thing is, is that he was devoutly religious. Like, he he kept doing all these outward religious activities, but, but when it came to this internal place in his heart, there was no sense of learning to stop and just be with God. There was no sense of learning to listen to God. In fact, did you know that the Hebrew word for obedience, which shows up all over in 1 Samuel, that it's also the same word for hearing, for listening? And that the primary downfall of Saul was that he was somebody who did not listen to God. He did not listen to God. And the king had been anointed to listen to God to be obedient, to lead God's people in fearing the Lord. Samuel goes on to say in in, in 1 Samuel 15, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? For to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed, this is the Hebrew word for listen, is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and the arrogance like the evil of idolatry, but because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected you as king. As we begin this journey together then, again, we're gonna see such a contrast between Saul and David. But I want to invite you with me to kind of be willing in in God's strength to do this hard work of going beneath the surface in your own life. And I think before we can enter in and look at these seven different pathways that we're going to talk about starting next Sunday uh, that, that lead to emotional health and spiritual maturity, I think before we can do that, this morning I want to end with just kind of giving us a little bit of space to do a, a spiritual and emotional physical and to look at some of the symptoms that may be clues for us in terms of where God wants to do some of his deep work in us. Now, eventually, we want to get beyond the symptoms, but, but the symptoms can be a place where we can start. And so in his book, Peter Scazzaro uh, talks about 10 symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. And you can find these in your bulletin, by the way. I've listed them for you. Um, we're just gonna take a couple minutes and I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna just go through each of them. If you wanna read about more, if you wanna hear more about them, you can always um, read about this in chapter one of his book. But as, as I list these off for you, here's, here's what I wanna ask you to do if you're willing to be honest with yourself today. I wanna ask you to, to just kind of pay attention to, to what one or two of these symptoms is most relevant to you right now in your life. And you can either circle it or star it in the bulletin or you can jot it down. But I just, I just want you to, I don't want you to, this is not about shame, this is about just being honest with ourselves. So, so here they are, here's 10, 10 top symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. Number one, using God to run from God. An example of this is that my prayers are usually about God doing my will, not me surrendering to his. Number two, ignoring anger, sadness, and fear. I am rarely honest with myself and or others about the feelings, hurts, and pains beneath the surface of my life. Number three, dying to the wrong things. I tend to deny healthy, God-given desires and pleasures of life, such as friendships, joy, music, beauty, laughter, and nature, At the same time, I find it difficult to die to my self-protectiveness, my defensiveness, my lack of vulnerability, and my judgmentalism. Number four, denying the impact of the past on the present. I rarely consider how my family of origin and significant people and events from my past have shaped my present. 
Number five, dividing life into secular and sacred compartments. I easily compartmentalize God to quote Christian activities while usually forgetting about him when I am working, shopping, studying, or recreating, or all the other aspects of my life. Number six, doing for God instead of being with God. This was a big one for Saul. I tend to evaluate my spirituality based upon how much I am doing for God. Number seven, spiritualizing away conflict. I usually miss out on true peace by smoothing over disagreements, burying tensions, and avoiding conflict rather than disrupting false peace, as Jesus did. Number eight, covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. I have a hard time speaking freely about my weaknesses, failures, and mistakes. Number nine, just a couple more, living without limits. Those close to me would say that I often try to do it all or that I bite off more than I can chew. And number 10, judging other people. I often find myself occupied and bothered by the faults of those around me. So put up those list of 10 there again. I want you to take a minute right now. Which one or two of those would best describe where you're at right now? Now maybe you're looking at all of them and saying, you know, actually all of those in some ways could describe me. I know I often feel that way when I look at it. Um, Here's the last thing I wanna say this morning though. I think one of the greatest challenges for us in terms of doing this work, and even right now of getting honest about these things, is that so quickly that shame voice turns up its volume. And I think we tend to live in a culture of guilt and shame, and I wanna make a distinction to you this morning as we do this work together. There's a difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit convicts us and wants us to see areas of our life where God wants to heal us and grow us. There's a, there's a difference between that and between guilt and shame. Conviction of the Holy Spirit, it, 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 it moves us towards God. It, 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 it reminds us that we need to rely deeply upon the grace of God, that it's about God's work in us that accomplishes this, whereas guilt and shame gets us stuck. And we find ourselves, it it attacks us at the place of our identity where we find ourselves saying things like, I'm a terrible person, I'm not a good Christian, I'm a lousy spouse, I'm an awful parent. I wanna say to you as clearly as I can that that kind of shame is not from God. So when you hear that volume, that shame voice being churned up for you, I wanna remind you of God's truth that there is no condemnation in Christ that it is because God accepts us as we are, not as we should be, but as we are, um, that we're able to do this work. God loves us as as we are, but he loves us too much to to just leave us that way. And so as we begin this journey together, our hope is that we could come before the Lord, relying upon his grace, saying, God, search my heart. Search me and know me. That's what David prayed. Help me to see what I can't see right now and do this deep work of healing and transformation in me so I can become the kind of person that you most desire me to be. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we ask this morning as we start this journey together, as we find the courage to take off our masks and to be honest with you and with ourselves and with each other, Lord, that you would just remind us that that this work is the work that you begin in us and it's the work that you'll bring to completion. And you call us to to play a part in it for we know that that you're you're not gonna heal and transform what we're not first willing to acknowledge. And so we ask that you would pour your light into all those hidden places in our hearts. And Lord, that you would embrace us with your grace and that your spirit will work powerfully in our lives so that we might become the kinds of people that you most desire us to be. It is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I'm gonna invite you to stand for the benediction today. I wanna say um, kind of a final comment here this morning before we go. If if you wanna get the most out of the sermon series, um, I would encourage you to to, uh, pick up this book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, And remember, you're gonna read the chapter ahead. So for next week, read chapter two. Uh, We're gonna talk about growing in our own self-awareness, knowing ourselves and knowing God. 
Um, I believe we had some out, out at the, the Welcome Center, but I think that they all sold out after the first service. So there might be a couple that are in the church library, but you could just go on Amazon and, and go ahead and, and pick that up if you are interested in that. The other resource is this Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day-by-Day -day Devotional. And this lines up with this, and again, you're gonna do the week's, read, week's reading ahead. Um, and, but I would highly just recommend this to you as well. And I think that this work is best done, honestly, when we do it in community, uh, when we're doing it in relationship with others. And so I'd encourage you in your life groups, or, or maybe you wanna pull together some friends to, to engage this together. Even this morning as you go home with those 10 symptoms, if, if you would even, maybe even talk with each other, talk in your families about what, which ones kind of did you most identify with. Oh. Every Sunday morning during this time at 9.30, we're gonna have an emotionally healthy spirituality class and you can jump into that even if you missed it today. We're also gonna do it on Wednesday nights at 6.30, so there's two options for you. Uh, or following this service right now, um, we have our Connecting Conversations class, which is really gonna focus around following up on what the sermon was about today. So, so those are some opportunities if you'd like to find ways to engage this work with others. We'll receive this benediction then as we go from this place. Let us go from this place then, confident of these words that Paul speaks in Philippians. The one who has done a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us go from this place in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen.